I'll share the screen with you now. All right, so today we are going to start with chronic kidney disease. And last time uh, you had to do self-study for uh, acute kidney injury, all right? So because uh, we could not have a lecture for the last two weeks due to the exams. Right, so chronic kidney disease, um, uh, this lecture is going to take about two hours and uh, we will start right away. So we'll start with the overview. Chronic kidney disease is a term that encompasses all degrees of decreased function of the kidneys from mild to moderate to severe decrease in kidney function. And the definition of chronic kidney disease is that there is decreased GFR, which is known as glomerular filtration rate of less than 60 ml per minute per 1.73 meters squared, okay? Uh, for at least three months. So please remember this definition. <clears throat> Most of the times the questions are from uh, uh, from the treatment part, but uh, this definition is also important. So keep in mind that I could ask you the definition in the form of a short answer question, okay? Uh, then regardless of the underlying etiology, CKD is characterized by progressive loss of functions over several months to years. Now, this is different from acute kidney injury. Acute kidney injury could develop within hours to days to weeks. But in chronic kidney disease, there is slow and progressive loss of function. And that is accompanied by gradual replacement of normal kidney architecture with fibrosis, interstitial fibrosis, right? Uh, which means in the interstitium. So fibrosis is something that is irreversible. So once fibrosis appears and the nephrons are destroyed, then there is no going back, all right? There is, it cannot be reversed. So in the US, there is a rising incidence and prevalence of chronic kidney disease and the outcome is poor and the same is happening in Saudi Arabia. And 30% of the people who are over the age of 65 years have got a stable disease. And stable disease means that their GFR is stable. It's not falling very rapidly or it goes up and down, okay? Uh, CKD is associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease and end-stage renal disease, ESRD. So that uh, this these things develop over a long period of time in most of the patients, but in uh, some unfortunate uh, people, it could develop uh, quite rapidly, but uh, on average, it develops slowly, okay? Uh, let's look at the pathophysiology. I hope you remember that each kidney contains approximately 1 million nephrons, and each one of these nephrons contributes to GFR. But what happens in chronic kidney disease is uh, that the nephron, nephrons are being destroyed. They are being replaced by, uh, due to many reasons that I'll show you, they are being replaced by fibrous tissue. Uh, but the kidneys have an innate ability to maintain the glomerular filtration rate, okay, Dis despite destruction of the nephrons. Now, how do they do that? There's hypertrophy and there is hyperfiltration, right? The remaining healthy nephrons manifest hyperfiltration and compensatory hypertrophy. Uh, this nephron adaptability allows for continued normal clearance of plasma solutes and also of creatinine. So they are maintaining creatinine at a normal level for quite a long time. But this hypertrophy and hyperfiltration can be detrimental as well. Uh, urea and creatinine start to show measurable increases only after the total GFR has fallen below 50%, right? So uh, the plasma creatinine value will approximately double with 50% reduction in GFR. Now, in the next slide, I'll show you uh, various stages of uh, chronic kidney disease, uh, but 
GFR, I hope you remember that the normal GFR is about 120 ml per minute per 1.73 meter square. Or you can simply say that the normal glomerular filtration rate is about 120 ml per minute, all right? Now, if there is a reduction, 50% reduction in the GFR, uh, the creatinine level will double. Now, what this means is that sometimes we have normal creatinine level. I hope that the creatinine level, you remember that the creatinine levels in females is 0.6 to 1.2, but it depends upon the lab that is giving you the result that will give you the normal ranges as well. And in the males, because they have got a bigger uh, muscle mass, you know, so their normal creatinine level is usually from 0.7 uh, milligram to 1.2 milligram per deciliter. So what we are saying is that uh, if the GFR is reduced by 50%, the creatinine will double. So uh, see over here, let us suppose that um, the creatinine rises from 0.6 to 1.2 milligram per deciliter in a patient. Now, they're both normal values, right? 0 0.6 to 1.2 is normal in females and also in males. Although it is still within the adult reference range, actually it represents a loss of 50% of functioning nephrons. Now, nobody goes to the lab and does his uh, creatinine level unless he has a problem or he or she has a problem or it is found on a routine examination, right? So most of the times we do not know as long as uh, the creatinine level is within the normal range. Uh, we do not know what the baseline was, all right? The hyperfiltration and hypertrophy, they have got benefits as well, although beneficial for maintaining GFR, but they have been hypothesized to represent a major cause of progressive renal dysfunction. So this... Uh, Hyperfiltration and hypertrophy is sort of a double-edged weapon. They have got benefits and uh, they have got uh, detrimental effects as well. So here are the stages of chronic kidney disease and the stages are classified according to the glomerular filtration rate, which is measured in milliliters per minute per 1.73 meters squared, okay? So 90 plus is considered as normal from 90 to 120 ml. Uh, let us suppose a person has got a GFR, a GFR of 92. Uh, we usually do not consider that as chronic kidney disease, although you can say that it might be, the person might be at a risk of developing chronic kidney disease. So when the GFR falls uh, to between 60 and 89, milliliter per minute per 1.73 meters squared, right? Then this is stage two chronic kidney disease. Again, it's very mild. So you must remember this uh, unit of measurement, all right? Milliliter per minute per 1.73 meters squared. I'll come back to this in one of the later slides. Now stage three um, chronic kidney disease is divided into two subgroups, stage 3A and stage 3B. And again, it's based on the GFR, 45 to 59 is 3A and 30 to 44 is 3B. Uh, stage four, that's where the things start going wrong. That's where the patient might start developing symptoms. Okay, so when the GFR is 15 to 29 ml per minute, then we call it stage four. So see how low it has fallen. We said that, that the normal GFR is 120 ml per minute, but here see the GFR has fallen down to 15 or fallen down to between 15 and 29. And when it falls below 15 ml per minute, then it is stage five. And then you'll have, uh, the patient will have many different signs and symptoms electrolyte abnormalities, anemias that I'll go, I'll show you later on, all right? So 90% plus is considered as normal kidney function, but the urine findings or structural abnormalities or genetic trait point to kidney disease. So we, we usually do not call, call it a kidney disease unless there are certain other findings 
like structural abnormalities or something in the genes, right? So 60 to 89 is mildly reduced uh, uh, kidney function and stage three is moderately reduced. Stage four is severely re reduced and stage five is very severe and we also call it end stage kidney failure. That means it cannot be stopped and it, it is definitely going to fall further. The disease is going to progress. Actually, you know, the disease progresses slowly. You know, we can slow down the progression or we can halt the progression for a certain period of time. But eventually, once a person develops chronic kidney disease, it will progress sooner or later, okay? So the increased glomerular capillary pressure, that is not a good thing. In chronic kidney disease, one of the uh, pathophysiological uh, disadvantages is that the glomerular capillary pressure is increased and this increased pressure damages the capillaries and that leads to certain conditions which are known as focal segmental glomerulosclerosis or global glomerulosclerosis because the disease is progressing and the things are going from bad to worse slowly and gradually. And there is a strong association between episodes of acute kidney injury and development of chronic kidney disease. If a person gets repeated attacks of acute kidney injury due to any reason, it could be due to drugs, it could be due to uh, something else, right? It could happen in diabetes. Uh, so repeated attacks of acute kidney injury can <clears throat> also lead to chronic kidney disease. And the factors that underlie the decrease in renal function are systemic hypertension, nephrotoxins like uh, NSAIDs, intravenous contrast media, which are quite dangerous. Uh, they can lead to acute kidney injury as well. And there are many other drugs. I hope uh, sulfonum, you, you know them, uh, a lot, a number of drugs, right? Sulfonamides or uh, you can say aminoglycosides are there, nitrofurantoin can cause damage uh, to the kidneys. Many drugs that uh, I'll show you, but the list is quite uh, long for nephrotoxic drugs, right? Decreased perfusion due to any reason from dehydration or shock or stenosis or atherosclerosis of renal arteries. Protein urea. Protein should not be there in the urine. In a normal person or with normal kidney function, there are no proteins in the urine. If you find proteins in the urine, that means the kidneys are damaged or they are not functioning normally. Hyperlipidemia can lead to uh, atherosclerosis and impaired kidney function. Hyperphosphatemia can have many deleterious effects on the kidneys through certain indirect mechanisms that we'll discuss later on. Smoking is not good as in all diseases and uncontrolled diabetes will cause progression of uh, chronic kidney disease. Actually, diabetes is the most common cause of chronic kidney disease, all right? And the second most common cause is hypertension, if you remember from your pathophysiology. So creatine is derived from muscles. It is a waste product that is generated in the muscles. So those people who have got a bigger muscle mass, like the males, uh, they, will, they produce more creatinine. Smaller individuals and females who have got a smaller muscle mass or children, their creatinine level is usually low, okay? In, in children, uh, chronic kidney disease is usually the result of congenital defects and I've already given you the causes in the males. The most common cause, uh, causes in the males are diabetes and uh, hypertension. Aging is an important cause. With aging, the kidney mass slowly and gradually declines. Okay, renal mass progressively declines with advancing age and glomerulosclerosis leads to decrease in GFR glomerulosclerosis. You know that glomerulus is a tuft of capillaries, okay? So when we say glomeruli, we mean capillaries. And these capillaries, they become hard and they become uh, sort of, uh, they become narrowed, okay? Due to many reasons. Uh, so the GFR is going to decrease and you know that 
chronic kidney disease means decrease in GFR. GFR decreases to 70 ml. Again, let me remind you, normal is 120 ml. So 70 ml by the age of 70 years. And because of all these changes, there are certain hemodynamic changes uh, which occur due to, um, uh, you know, decrease in glomerular capillary plasma flow rate, you know, due to glomerular sclerosis, loss of renal mass. We are losing nephrons. We have a million or 1.2 million in each kidney, but slowly they start getting destroyed. And uh, when 50% of uh, these nephrons are destroyed, then maybe the GFR will fall below 60 ml. And the, as I said, the definition of chronic kidney disease is that the GFR remains below 60 ml per minute for at least uh, three months. So hyalinization of E efferent arterioles, tubulo interstitial fibrosis. Just remember that there is fibrosis that is taking place in the kidneys. And aging is associated with, with altered sensitivity to vasoactive stimuli. There is more vasoconstriction than vasodilation. And vasoconstriction means that the blood flow to the kidneys is decreased. And aging is also associated with get greater decrease in the number of cortical glomeruli relative to medullary glomeruli. So uh, there, there will be shunting of the blood. Shunting of the blood means they are passing from arteries or arterioles into the venules without uh, going through the nephrons, okay? Without being filtered into the nephrons. Right, so hyperkalemia is uh, one of the problems that uh, we develop in chronic kidney disease. The ability to maintain potassium excretion at near normal levels is generally maintained in CKD as long as aldosterone secretion and distal flow are maintained. Now, if you remember, aldosterone causes sodium and water retention, and it causes uh, increased elimination of potassium, all right? And it has aldosterone has its effect mainly in the kidneys, uh, in the collecting ducts of the kidneys, if you remember the histology of the kidneys. Uh, but aldosterone also has the same effect in the colon, in the GIT. Okay, it causes excretion of potassium in the colon as well. So hyperkalemia uh, will be uh, avoided as long as aldosterone is there. So increased potassium excretion in the GIT also protects against hyperkalemia and that too is under the control of aldosterone. But hyperkalemia develops usually when the GFR has fallen below 20 to 25 ml per minute, at which point the kidneys have decreased ability to excrete potassium. Well, right, that's where the problem starts. So a high, a hyperkalemia can be observed sooner in patients who ingest high quantities of potassium or who, who are taking a potassium-rich diet, have low serum aldosterone levels, and causes of low serum aldosterone levels are diabetes, ACE inhibitors, you know, ACE inhibitors prevent the conversion of angiotens. I mean, yes, they prevent the conversion of angiotensin one to angiotensin two, and angiotensin 2 causes aldosterone secretion. So when angiotensin 2 is not there, aldosterone will be low, all right? Then NSAIDs and beta blockers, you know, they all cause low aldosterone secretion. Hyperkalemia and chronic kidney disease can be aggravated by extracellular shift. Now we have got very high levels of potassium inside the cells. Inside the cells, the concentration of potassium is about 140 milli equivalents per liter. And outside, it is just uh, 3.5 to 5.5 milli equivalents, right? But sometimes the potassium will shift from inside the cell to the outside of the cell. And that is known as extracellular shift. Why does that happen? That happens due to, due to lack of insulin it could happen in acidemia, which means when there is a high concentration of hydrogen ions, 
when whenever there is a high concentration of hydrogen ions in the plasma the hydrogen ions will be exchanged for potassium in the cells all the cells have got hydrogen potassium exchangers so whenever there is a high level of uh, a high level of hydrogen ions which is known as acidemia the hydrogen will be taken up by the cells and potassium will uh, come out of the cells okay so that will lead to hypokalemia hypokalemia is uncommon in chronic kidney disease all right uh, unless there is poor intake or diarrhea or use of diuretics now metabolic acidosis again all these things happen when the gfr is very low usually when it is below 15 ml per minute okay so metabolic acidosis generally develops when the patient has stage 5 chronic kidney disease and stage 5 starts from below 15 ml per minute okay per minute per 1.73 meters squared okay remember that uh, and there is a normal increase in the anion gap we have done anion gap as well in pathophysiology right anion gap you have to have the you know you send the blood to the lab and the lab will return you the results of sodium uh, and uh, bicarbonate and chloride so we add chloride and bicarbonate and then we subtract it from sodium whatever the sodium normal sodium level in the blood are 135 to 145 milli equivalents per liter okay so um, uh, anion gap is not higher than 20 milli equivalent per liter uh, so normal anion gap uh, what do we mean by an anion gap you know it means that there are certain negatively charged ions that we usually do not measure like phosphates and sulfates and negatively charged proteins right their level increases so accumulation of phosphates sulfates urates other organic anions you know uh, their concentration increases in plasma but we do not measure them we usually measure the in negatively charged ions we measure bicarbonate and we measure chloride okay so you know that in metabolic acidosis bicarbonate is low it has gone down you know it has gone down below 22 so these to compensate for the loss of negative charges these unmeasured we call them unmeasured ions negatively charged uh, uh, anions okay uh, so uh, that is known as anion gap increased anion gap and the second reason is that kidneys are unable to produce enough ammonium ammonium you know it is nh4 plus which means that it has got four hydrogen ions and when it has a charge and it is inside the renal tubules because of the charge it will not be reabsorbed it will go out with urine all right this is known as iron trapping if you remember from the general principles of uh, pharmacology that you did a long time back okay so um, there uh, there is the kidneys are unable to produce enough ammonium so there will be no hydrogen loss metabolic acidosis has deleterious effects on protein balance right it can lead to malnutrition it can lead to protein energy malnutrition loss of lean body mass lean body mass means the muscle mass and it can lead to muscle weakness it can lead to increased fibrosis it can lead to progression of chronic kidney disease uh, it can lead to development of renal osteodystrophy osteodystrophy means the bones become weak because whenever there is a higher amount of acid it is known as acidemia. Acidemia means more acid in the blood. More acid means more hydrogen ions, okay? So uh, whenever you have got more hydrogen ions, the kidney, the bones try to buffer them and they lose uh, calcium and phosphate. So uh, they lose minerals and they become weak, all right? And acidosis may also interfere with uh, vitamin D metabolism. 
Now, salt and water abnormalities, that's the last thing that happens in chronic kidney disease, okay? Uh, they usually happen when the GFR is very, very low from 10 to 15 ml, okay? Uh, sodium and free water excretion becomes impaired when the GFR falls below 10 to 15 ml per minute. And what will happen when the water is not being excreted? There is going to be accumulation of water in the body. It is known as volume overload. And volume overload is going to cause um, a workload on the heart as well. It is going to cause peripheral edema, okay? And if it progresses and uh, the GFR further decreases, it can also lead to pulmonary edema and hypertension. Uh, so with excessive intake of sodium and water, this could appear at uh, an earlier stage. Then we can get anemia because, you know, erythropoietin is produced in the kidneys. And erythropoietin is a hormone that goes from kidneys to the bone marrow and it causes the production of red blood cells. So the person can get normal chromic, normal cystic anemia, uh, which develops from decreased renal synthesis of erythropoietin. The anemia starts early in the course of the disease and becomes more severe as renal mass shrinks. So all you know, all these things that I'm telling you uh, or I'm mentioning in pathophysiology are important because uh, you're trying to, to treat when a patient has got chronic kidney disease, this is what you're trying to treat. If there is anemia, we'll, you'll try to treat this anemia. You might give uh, some analogs of erythropoietin or you might give iron supplements, right? We'll, when we come to the treatment, we'll discuss that, okay? If there is uh, water accumulation and the GFR is very low, then you have to treat that as well. Maybe you want to do uh, this uh, dialysis or maybe you want to give loop diuretics, okay? So it depends upon the GFR. There is no reticulocyte. Usually, you know, when um, there is anemia, uh, the, the, this erythropoietin increases the production of RBCs and many immature RBCs, they are released into the blood, bloodstream and they are known as reticulocytes. Normally we have less than 1% reticulocytes in the blood. You know, when you send a patient's blood for complete blood count, CBC, uh, you get back the results of reticulocytes as well. So normally, uh, reticulocyte count is less than 1%. If it's more than that, that means the production of RBCs has increased due to some reason. Uremia, you know, we'll come to this later on, induces platelet dysfunction and platelets, platelets play a very important role role in preventing bleeding, right? So there could be chronic blood loss when a person has uh, platelet dysfunction. Then, as I said, there could be mineral and bone disorder because of uh, acidemia, more acid in the blood. So when GFR falls, less phosphate is filtered, right? So we get hyperphosphatemia. In stages four and five, hyperphosphatemia develops, and hyperphosphatemia has got many adverse effects. And one of them is it suppresses vitamin D synthesis. It might also increase the secretion of parathyroid hormone. Uh, it can cause hypocalcemia. You know, when there is less vitamin D, what are the functions of vitamin D? The functions of vitamin D is increased absorption of calcium from the gut. That is why whenever you give calcium, you give vitamin D as well. And vitamin D also causes deposition of calcium in the bones. It causes reabsorption of calcium in the kidneys, right? So whenever there is hyperphosphatemia, there is hypocalcemia. You must remember one more thing, that the body uh, maintains the product of phosphate and calcium um, that we did in pathophysiology, okay? Now that could lead to increased parathyroid hormone secretion. And that could lead to low vitamin D levels, hypocalcemia. Uh, no, actually it is due to hypocalcemia or low vitamin D levels, right? So whenever there are low vitamin D levels, whenever there is hypocalcemia, 
whenever there is hypophosphatemia, the, all of these are going to increase PTH secretion and PTH levels uh, in the plasma that is going to have adverse effects on the bones. So high PTH levels increase bone resorption of phosphate. And that would lead to renal osteodystrophy that we discussed previously. Uh, if PTH level remains elevated, bone turnover increases. That is known as osteitis fibrosa. So the bone will start losing um, calcium and phosphates. Okay. So, you know, we have seen two causes of osteitis fibrosa in chronic kidney disease. One is uh, acidemia, high levels of hydrogen ions in the plasma. And second is higher levels of parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone will pull calcium out of the bones. It will decrease the excretion of calcium um, in the kidneys as well. And it will increase the level of calcium in, in plasma or in the blood. Or alternatively, we can have an adynamic bone disease. Adynamic bone disease means that the uh, turnover is low, all right? Here the turnover is increased, but in adynamic disease, it's low. And that happens, you know, in increased age or with corticosteroid therapy or use of vitamin D and high calcium load, you know. So bone turnover may, uh, it will be low. You know, we need bone turnover because we all the time we keep on repairing the bones, okay? We keep on digesting a part of the bone and uh, we keep on making new bone through osteoblast and osteoclast activity. All right. So there could be dialysis related amyloidosis. What is amyloidosis? Amyloidosis is accumulation of a protein which is known as beta-2 microglobulin. And this starts happening after eight to 10 years of uh, dialysis. And this is more common in underdeveloped countries for some reason. Now, again, you know, in certain slides I've written for, for reference only. And when I say for reference only, it means you should study it on your own. And these slides will be useful for you when you go to your clinics, right? When you go do your internship, many times you will be asked to uh, do presentations. And I get messages from students that uh, they need some slides or something for their presentations uh, when they are in their clinics or when they are doing their rotations. Okay, so these slides are not going to the details. This is a very good slide. It gives you all uh, the pathophysiological changes that are happening in the kidneys and their causes that are given at the top. Okay, so you must study it at your own and keep it with yourself so that you use it uh, if you have a presentation on CKD during your internship. Now, etiology, what is the cause of chronic kidney disease? There are so many causes, diabetes. I said most important, most common cause, hypertension. Second, most common cause, there could be vascular diseases like vasculitides, uh, which means inflammation of the blood vessels, you know, uh, this is uh, an antibody uh, which is there in uh, uh, what is known as chronilometrous uh, polyangitis, okay? That's a disease. Uh, then um, glomerular diseases can lead to chronic kidney disease. There are many different types of glomerular diseases. Membranous nephropathy, l port syndrome, which is a genetic disease, mm -hmm. systemic lupus, erythritosis, chronic kidney disease, uh, unrecovered acute kidney injury, tubulo interstitial disease, right? Uh, and then, you know, drug sulfonamides and allopurinol and NSAIDs and Sjogren syndrome, all of these can lead to tubulo interstitial fibrosis. Then, urinary tract obstruction, like in benign prosthetic hyperplasia or kidney stones, uh, recurrent kidney stone disease, you know, or there could be problems congenital problems, particularly these are more common in boys than in girls, right? Prognosis is very important, you know, patients with CKD generally have progressive loss of uh, kidney function uh, and are at risk of end stage. Uh, uh, so progresses is, you know, most of the times it is unavoidable. The disease does progress. 
but the rate of progression could be slow or it could be rapid. And you can control that. Uh, age is a very important factor. At old age, the progression is difficult to control. Uh, whatever the underlying diagnosis is, preventive implementation of preventive measures, you can slow down the progress, you can halt it for some time, and individual patient. And you know, there are many interventions that you can do like chronic renal replacement therapy. When we say renal replacement therapy, many times you will see written RRT. RRT stands for renal replacement therapy, okay? That could be dialysis, you know, uh, renal replacement in place of kidneys. It is the, the machine that is working. Or even renal transplant is known as renal replacement therapy, right? So the earlier you start, although there is a criteria for starting renal replacement therapy or dialysis, but that would prevent, if you start it, it would prevent urinic complications. So there is a validated model that has been developed that uses routine uh, lab results to predict uh, faster progression. And that in model includes, uh, if the, you know, lower GFR, we have written estimated GFR. We don't get exact GFR. We always get an estimate of GFR. So the lower the estimated GFR, the poorer will be the prognosis. Albumin urea. Albumin is a protein. So if albumin appears in the urine, that's not a good sign. Okay, higher. Usually we have no proteins in the urine. The healthy people or persons whose kidneys are working normally, they have no protein, right? So the higher the albumin urea, the worse the prognosis. Younger age, and male sex, okay? Other factors that predict an elevated risk of kidney failure are uh, serum albumin. So urine albumin will be high, but serum albumin will be low. Calcium or for bicarbonates, they could be low and high phosphate, not a good sign. Low calcium or high phosphate, right? They are not good signs. Now, what this shows you is that, you know, uh, it is showing that the normal kidney function is when the GFR is between 90 to 120 ml per minute per 1.73 meter square. 60 to 90 is uh, early stage kidney disease. Usually we don't find that unless we find it by chance. But when it falls below 60 and it stays below 60 for three months, then we call it chronic kidney disease. So most of the people are in this all right. Uh, so estimates of GFR are normally expressed in 1.73 meters squared, right? Body surface area. That is the average body surface area of an adult, okay? Obviously, females have got smaller surface area and males have got bigger surface area, but that is an average that we have taken. That is why we always use milliliter per minute per 1.73 meter squared, okay? All right, and this is an, again, for your reference, you know, it just shows the relationship between GFR and albumin creatinine ratio. We have got different levels of albumin creatinine ratio, A1, A2, A3, and this shows you the this, this combination of uh, GFR and albumin creatinine ratio and the risk of progression of chronic kidney disease, okay? So when these things are increasing, the, pro the risk of progression increases. And you know, again, this is for, for your reference. I've given you the website to over here. So you can go to this website and not, not, this will not be on the examination, but this might be useful for you when you go to your clinics. This is how you calculate albumin creatinine ratio. There are these calculators available. And again, this is from the same calculator has given you the definition of 
A1, A2, and A3 uh, albumin creatinine ratio. This is albumin excretion weight. It is written over here, right? So these are for your reference only. Patient education is important. You know, we must have, we must give some information to the patient. Like you should avoid factors leading to disease progression that I gave you in the etiology. We, can, we should tell him about the natural disease progression, which cannot be stopped. It could be slowed down, but it cannot be stopped. We can tell him about the medications that are nephrotoxic. Uh, they can avoid nephrotoxins, diet, renal replacement modalities, including peritoneal dialysis or hemodialysis or transplantation if it is needed. Now, women of childbearing age, you know, in chronic kidney disease, fertility is reduced. And if a woman gets a renal transplant and she becomes pregnant, then it is not a good thing. You know, it is dangerous. Uh, pregnancy could be associated with higher risk um, in women who do not have uh, um, renal disease. Okay. In addition, many medications used to treat CKD are potentially teratogenic, and the most common are AS inhibitors and ARBs. Okay, uh, as I have written over here, uh, and certain immunosuppressive treatments require clear counseling. So these things uh, must be um, communicated to the patients, right? And obviously this is a part of uh, patient education. He must uh, keep his blood pressure under control. Sometimes you suppress renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system by giving uh, ACE inhibitors or ARBs. The patient must control diabetes and start stop smoking, right? So these are certain measures that could be included in patient education. Now, clinical presentation appear only the signs and symptoms might appear when the GFR is below 30. Uh, and uh, with stages 1 to 3, which means above 30, the patient is asymptomatic. And even in the early stages, early portions of stage 4, which is between 15 to 30 ml per minute, the symptoms might not be there or the symptoms might be subclinical, okay? There are no clinically evident disturbances in water electrolyte balance or endocrine metabolic derangements uh, when the GFR is above 30 ml per minute. These disturbances become clinically manifest in stages 4 and 5 when GFR is below 30 ml per minute, okay? Uremic manifestations, we don't know how they are caused. There are certain signs and symptoms that I'll show you in the later slide. But while, what is this uremia? It is thought that there are certain toxins that are produced by the body in kidney disease. But what those toxins are, we do not know. Then metabolics, acidosis, as I mentioned, can develop in stage five. There could be salt and water balance. We have already done this in the previous slide in pathophysiology. And anemia can develop due to decreased synthesis of erythropoietin in the kidneys, and it could manifest itself as weakness or muscle weakness or fatigue, or is even in, in, in impaired cognitive function, which means brain function or intellectual functions, immune functions or cardiovascular functions. All of these things could be there. Right, so uh, National Kidney Foundation uh, has uh, divided chronic kidney disease into five stages. And I've already uh, mentioned to you, you know, I've shown you this diagram as well, or this table as well, and showed you that normal, mild, or moderate, or severely you know, reduced kidney function over here. So when do the symptoms appear? Now, what I'm showing you in this slide, um, it does not always happen, but it can happen. All right, it is not necessary. For example, you know, in stage two, the patient usually has high blood pressure, but maybe he doesn't have it, or maybe he has controlled it. Maybe there is no protein. It is possible that he will have protein in urine, or maybe he doesn't have protein in urine. Even in stage three, sometimes patients don't have proteins in urine. Maybe anemia will appear or it will not appear, right? But by the time the patient reaches stage five, then most of these symptoms like 
anemia, hyperparathyroidism, cardiovascular disease, malnutrition, fluid and electrolyte abnormalities, bone disease, all these things can appear in stage five. Now, this is what I said. Again, this is for your reference. So uh, I'll not read it, but uh, uremia, I know it has symptoms like pericarditis, encephalopathy, peripheral neuropathy, restless leg syndrome, uh, gastrointestinal symptoms, malnutrition, lots of things, you know. And why, why are these things happening? Due to some uh, toxins in the body. What are those toxins? We do not know. Right. Uh, again, clinical presentation, this is for your reference only. So I'm going to skip that, okay? But you must read it on your own and you should keep these things. They'll be useful for you uh, later on. Differential diagnosis, uh, quite a lot of things, but you know, with the combination of our lab uh, workup, uh, we can reach the diagnosis, particularly with GFR. Okay, so this is the workup. Again, the workup is quite detailed, but I'm just giving you what we do, okay? You do renal function. There are certain renal function formulas which are although very simple, but you don't have to memorize them. You do ultrasonography, very important uh, examination, radiography and CT, MRI, radionucleotide scans. You can do a biopsy and screening, okay? Uh, and again, this slide is for your reference, but there is one important thing over here. You must know that there is uh, this test for cystatin, cystatin C, which is a small protein that is expressed in all nucleated cells and produced at a constant rate, and it is freely filtered by the glomerulus. It is not secreted, but is instead reabsorbed by the tubular epithelial cells and is catabolized. So it does not return to the bloodstream. So the thing is that, uh, you know, we measure creatinine, but this cystatin C is one, also very important for measuring GFR. So these properties of cystatin uh, make it valuable endogenous marker of renal function. Okay. So this is the only thing that you have to keep in mind. Now, work up for specific conditions, what specific conditions, antinuclear antibodies, complement levels, hepatitis B and C, again, for your reference, not at this stage. At this stage, you just have to understand what I have explained to you in pathophysiology or the derangements that happen in different stages or that could happen in different stages of chronic kidney disease, right? Screening is something controversial. There are some uh, two different, we have got two different types of colleges um, in the USA, American College of Physicians, and uh, there is another um, uh, Neph Nephrologist Association, I'll show you it's here. So ACP recommends, uh, uh, recommends that there should be no screen, right? And, but these are weak recommendations <clears throat> and they're based on low quality evidence. <clears throat> Again, they said don't test for proteinuria in adults with, with or without diabetes. Again, it's a weak recommendation. But on the contrary, American Society of Nephrologists, ASN, they say that uh, screening must be done. Strongly advocate CKD screening even in patients without risk factors, right? So we'll go with uh, Society of Nephrology actually, because these are weak recommendations. And these are the formulas for creatinine clearance, okay? Different in males, this part is for males. If it is female, just multiply it by 0.85. But this is again, you. this is not going to be on the examination. This is for your reference only. Again, another formula for calculating, uh, you know, uh, estimated GFR. Okay, previously I gave you uh, the formula for albumin creatinine ratio, uh, urinary albumin creatinine ratio. Here I'm giving you formulas for estimated GFR, so two formulas over here. And we need just three things. You know, gender, when a patient comes to you, you already know the gender, you know the age. The only thing that you have to measure is creatinine. And you know, you just have to put in the values, like click over here, you know, put, enter the age, and whatever creatinine level you give, and then 
You can click on view results. So these are available on the internet, okay? So the only thing that you have to remember in this slide is that this CKD EPI equation is more reliable than MDRD equation that I showed you previously, okay? So for this specific patient, we got two different results. Now, uh, for this uh, CKD EPI result was 95.4 ml per minute and uh, MDRD was 90.3. So what they're saying is that MDRD gives a lower estimate. So this one is a better indicator or this is a better test to calculate the estimated GFR, all right? Right, so <clears throat> it's time for a break. Uh, what we'll do is just uh, let me see renal calculation. Uh, okay, so we'll stop here for some time. We'll take a 15 minutes break and we'll come back after the break and we'll continue with the lecture. And uh, I think we will need just one more hour or a little above one hour to complete this lecture, all right? So I'll see you after 15 minutes. And remind me to start the recording again. All right, <clears throat> so I hope everyone is back from the break. Um, and we are going to start the lecture once again. And you might have noticed that um, when I post my lectures on YouTube, there are a lot of students from other countries, they also watch those lectures, all right? So that is why I give some details that are good for all types of health sciences students. Uh, all right, so let's continue where we stopped, uh, from where we stopped. So renal function calculation in elderly patients. Now elderly patients, as I have previously mentioned, they already have reduced renal mass they have uh, impaired renal function. So we have to be a little bit careful, right? Age is an important consideration with, res with respect to estimated GFR. And if you remember in one of the previous slides, I said that by the age of 70 years, the GFR goes down from 120 ml per minute to 70 ml per minute. So age 70, GFR 70 ml per minute approximately, but there is a huge uh, individual variation over there. Therefore, in elderly patients, an estimated GFR must be determined using uh, a formula that includes the age. And both the formulas that I showed you previously, they included the age as well. So here's one example. Uh, we have got a man, we have got men with different ages. Uh, with different serum creatinine and their estimate GFR is going to be different. So the weight is the same, 70 kilo, kilogram man, but uh, one of them is uh, 25 years old and two are 80 years old, right? So if you look at the serum creatinine, they both have the same serum creatinine, but there is a big difference in the age. So there is going to be a big difference in the estimated GFR. So a 25 year old man with the same serum creatinine will have a GFR of 74 ml per minute. But an 80 year old man with a serum creatinine of 1.2 milligram per DL will have 50, 58 ml below 60. So he falls into the category of chronic kidney disease. But this young man with the same serum creatinine is uh, it does not have chronic kidney disease by definition. Uh, okay, although it is a bit low you know, for a man who is 25 years old, but that's uh, how it has been calculated using MDRD equation. Now, look at this 80 year old man. These two have got uh, the same age, but the creatinine is different. This man has a creatinine of two milligram as opposed to 1.2 milligram. So his GFR or estimated GFR has gone down to 32. It's very close to stage four, although it is not yet stage four, which is below 30 ml per minute. Uh, so uh, you see that in old age, with a, one of the values like age or serum creatinine, uh, if one of them changes, then the estimated GFR also changes, all right? 
So this is uh, something we take into account when we are measuring the GFR of an old, old person. Now, renal biopsy, again, is for your reference only. You know, <clears throat> I'll not go into these details. This is for the nephrologist to do. But what I've shown you over here is I've shown you, I'll show you the needles. And we have seen them previously as well in other cancers. Uh, percutaneous renal biopsy means through the body surface, through the skin, uh, with the help of ultrasonography. And we did that in prostate cancer as well. You know, we took uh, a transperineal biopsy and we had uh, the same needle that I've shown you over here. It is a very uh, wide needle, you know, pretty with a pretty big bore. Uh, and this is how it is. It is um, graduated. So <clears throat> this is known as a core biopsy. We can take a core biopsy or we can take a fine needle biopsy, you know, which has got a very narrow needle. And this is the sort of apparatus that we use. Uh, and the, the difference between these two is because the needle is narrow over here and wide over here. So just like in prostate cancer, there is a high risk of bleeding with these needles. But the benefit or the advantage is that we get more uh, tissue and uh, we can uh, look at that tissue with more certainty under a microscope. Okay, so it's good for the pathologist. Right, so now that we have uh, set the scenario, we know the back background, we can go on to the treatment of chronic kidney disease. And there is really not much uh, that we can do. I will give you the drugs, um, the list of the drugs, which is over here. But remember that we cannot stop the progression of chronic kidney disease. We can slow it down. We can halt it for some time, but we cannot stop it. All right. So these are the drugs, calcium salts, calcium acetate, calcium carbonate, vitamin D analogs, which include calcitriol, toxir, calciferol, and pericalcitol, uh, calcif calcifidiol, okay? We have got phosphate scavengers like lanthanum carbonate, sevalimer carbonate, or there are different types of salts used with that, sucroferic oxyhydroxide, okay? So we have got PO4 scavengers, hematopoietic growth factors, apoetin alpha, darboetin uh, that you have done in your pharmacology as well. We have got a lot of different iron products that include ferrous sulfate, iron dextran. You know, if you remember, uh, you know, I've got details of all these drugs, but that will make the lecture too long. Maybe I'll record another lecture, another lecture in which I'll give you the pharmacology and adverse effects and warnings and the black box warnings of these drugs and their brand names. But I've not included that in this lecture because, you know, if I give you pharmacology and adverse effects of all these drugs, then the lecture, then the lecture will become too uh, long and extensive, right? So, but just uh, to remind you that iron dextran has got a high risk of causing hypersensitivity reactions, okay? But then we have got iron sucrose, ferric gluconate, ferrumoxitol, ferric pyrophosphate, ferric carboxy, maltose. Then we have got calcimimetics, which include etel calcitide and sinacalcid. Just to remind you, this has got this word tide in it, etel calcitide, any drug that has got this tide in the end is a peptide like teriperatide. Uh, and uh, we have got uh, <clears throat> certain drugs in diabetes, a lot of drugs, but any drug, even we have got antiviral drugs, uh, which have got this uh, suffix tied. So whenever you have got this tied in the end, it means it is a peptide, right? And peptides, you know, they're usually not given orally. Most of the times they're given subcutaneously uh, or intramuscularly. Uh, but um, uh, the thing is some of these, we have got some of them that can be given orally as well. Although a peptide will be destroyed, but it is protected. The tablet or the capsule is made in such a way that it will not be destroyed in the stomach, okay? 
Then we have got SGLT2 inhibitors that are used for diabetes, but that have found to be uh, beneficial in um, heart failure and also in chronic kidney disease. And we have got dapagliflozin and canagliflozin in that. And then we have got two drugs, uh, one I've shown you previously, or maybe I'll show you later on, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, finally renowned is the drug that falls in this group, okay? Now, uh, what should be our treatment approach? Um, measures to delay or halt chronic kidney disease. Early diagnosis is important, and that is why, you know, sometimes uh, screening is important to um, identify the disease. Then we have to institute secondary preventive measures. Uh, we can refer the patient to the nephrologist if we find impairment of kidney function, low GFR or proteins in urine, particularly in diabetics, and timely planning for renal replacement therapy, which includes dialysis. You know, patients presenting with acute indications for dialytic therapy should be transferred to hospital center where acute dialysis can be performed. Uh, but, you know, again, you know, different... Uh, nephrologists and different societies have got slightly different um, guidelines um, and the Canadian Society of Nephrology recommends delaying dialysis in patients without without symptoms. So, um, or until their GFR, estimated GFR uh, falls to below 6 ml, which is quite low, okay? Uh, but it depends, you know, it depends not only on GFR, it depends upon the signs and symptoms of urinia as well. Mm -hmm. So, or you see here it is written, onset of urinia or fluid overload or hyperkalemia or acidemia, all these things are indications for dialysis. Close monitoring should begin when eGFR reaches 15 ml per minute. So after this, any of these things could develop and uh, we can uh, start dialysis, or at least we can prepare the patient by uh, by implanting a fistula, you know, or by preparing a fistula, which is known as arteriovenous fistula, okay? Uh, and I showed you that in, uh, in pathophysiology lectures. So additional risk factors for dialysis include uh, uremic symptoms uh, and uh, rate of renal function decline. If the renal function, you know, is declining, you measure GFR at, at certain intervals. And if you find that it's going down very rapidly, then again, you have to plan for a dialysis. The measures for delaying or halting pro, uh, progression, a treatment of the underlying condition and achieve target values for blood pressure. You know, the value is 120 by 80 that is recommended these days, or at least below 130. Hyperlipidemia, so in certain cases, uh, you have to, particularly in heart cases, you have to use uh, statins and azetamib as well. Uh, you can use SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, in, uh, particularly in diabetic, DKD stands for diabetic kidney disease, okay? Use of non-steroidal mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist. I mentioned finally renone, but this is SSC renone as well. Okay, so these are the two drugs. I don't know whether this one is available on the market or not, but this one is definitely available. Then avoidance of nephrotoxins like NSAIDs or radiocontrast media or aminoglycosides, right? Uh, there are some other drugs as well that I've mentioned previously, or I will mention later on. Aggressive glycemic control, and the target is below seven, but there is a problem with aggressive glycemic control and aggressive uh, hyper uh, blood pressure control as well. That actually causes more damage than uh, benefit. Use of renin angiotensin system blockers. What are renin angiotensin system blockers? They are ACE inhibitors and they are aldosterone antagonists, and they are uh, ARBs, angiotensin receptor blockers, okay? Uh, they are useful in diabetic kidney disease, and they are useful in protein urea as well. Actually, if a patient has protein urea, most of the nephrologists, they start 
ACE inhibitors. So use of ACE inhibitors or ARBs in patients with protein media. The general principles for treatment of chronic kidney disease, uh, you know, if the patient is taking any other medication, now this is the job of the pharmacist, you know, you have to determine the doses and dosing intervals of drugs that are excreted or metabolized renally. You should adjust the doses and durations of the dosing durations accordingly. Some drugs are contraindicated in moderate to severe re renal impairment. I have mentioned previously sulfonamides and aminoglycosides and radio contrast media and NSAIDs, nitrofurantoin, okay? Long list. Uh, because of potentially serious effects from drug or metabolite accumulation, uh, then routine consultation of appropriate references should be undertaken when prescribing a new drug. You know, most of the times in elderly people, chronic kidneys, kidney disease is not an isolated disease. It occurs with many other comorbidities. So the patient is using many other medications as well. So if you want to add another drug to control hypertension or diabetes or hyperlipidemia, heart diseases, heart failure, whatever, you know, you have to uh, look at the information, okay? Uh, you have to look at the dosing guides and you have to monitor the levels clinically. Hospitalized patients undergoing other types of continuous renal replacement therapy also require close monitoring. So an experienced clinical pharmacist can be invaluable in assisting to design. So this is a good field of specialization uh, for pharmacists. Now, blood pressure control, um, the American College of Car Cardiology and American Heart Association, their guidelines suggest a target blood pressure of less than 130 by 80 millimeter of mercury. Uh, no, KDGO guidelines, you know, um, for adults with CKD who are not receiving dialysis, recommend systolic blood pressure below 120. So systolic is actually more important than diastolic. And uh, it is also more difficult to control, right? Systolic is considered more important and also more difficult to control, okay? Now, <clears throat> Uh, ACE inhibitors and ARBs are recommended with close monitoring for renal deterioration. You, you know that ACE inhibitors and ARBs, they decrease GFR. And because they decrease GFR, they will increase creatinine levels and they will increase uh, potassium levels as well. So we have got a cutoff uh, value from the baseline. If the increase is 30%, we have to discontinue these medications, okay? Right, with every dose change, serum creatinine level needs to be monitored. If serum creatinine level increases more than 30% from baseline after adding these, uh, uh, um, these renin angiotensin system blockers, which are ACE inhibitors and ARBs, uh, then they have to be stopped, okay? ACE inhibitors, ARBs have to be stopped if the creatinine or potassium level goes above 30% uh, from the baseline and avoid ACE inhibitors, right? And there are certain other conditions like renal failure, which is uh, quite advanced, bilateral renal artery stenosis, or here you are going to avoid NSAIDs as well, even in solitary kidney disease, okay? So these are the... Uh, these are the measures you take for controlling the blood pressure. Now, protein is something controversial that how much, whether you're going to reduce protein intake or not. Um, you know, some guidelines, they recommend that protein intake should be reduced, but many studies have found that whether you reduce protein intake or you don't reduce it, the outcome is not different, all right? Diabetic kidney disease data support the use of ACE inhibitors with or without protein urea. Uh, Non-diabetic kidney disease, ACE inhibitors and ARBs slow down progression of disease among patients with protein urea 
of greater than 500 milligram per day. Okay, so both these are recommending uh, use of ACE inhibitors and ARBs in cases of proteins in the urine. Now this modification of diet and renal disease, MDRD, you know, um, in one of their studies, dietary protein restriction 2.58.6 is easier to remember, 0.6 or 0.8 gram per kilogram body day, uh, per days, right? Now, let us suppose it is 0.6. Let's make it 0.6. So if a person weighs uh, 60 kilogram, that means 0.6 into 60 is equal to 36 grams. 36 grams is a very small amount of protein, right? So he cannot take more than 36 grams. Now, they compared this to usual protein diet, which is at least 1.3 gram per kilogram. So the, it did not significantly change GFR over three years. So it is a pretty long study over three years. So that is why whether the patient has to strictly reduce uh, protein, you know, 2.6 or 0.8 gram per kilogram or eat normal proteins, that is a little bit uh, controversial. Uh, I was talking to one of my friends who is a nephrologist he said that he does not uh, advise protein restrictions, at least in the initial phases below 60 ml per minute, uh, because that can lead to malnutrition. Protein restriction needs to be closely monitored because low serum albumin is associated with poor outcome among dialysis patients. So you see, it has got drawbacks as well. And protein restriction is not recommended in children. Uh, vitamin D supplementation, uh, this uh, pericalcitol, which is a synthetic vitamin D analog, is approved by FDA for prevention and treatment of secondary hyperparathyroidism, right? So hyperphosphatemia or low vitamin D or hypocalcemia, they cause hyperparathyroidism. They increase PTH levels, okay? So you have to control them. So one of the ways is pericalcitol, which is a vitamin D analog. Um, this meta-analysis found that pericalcitol also can safely reduce protein excretion. So double benefit, okay, in stages two to five. In a prospective control study, daily vitamin D supplementation decreased albumin urea in patients with stage three or four chronic kidney disease right, who had low vitamin D levels and high PTH levels, and also decreased albumin to creatinine ratio, right? So vitamin D supplementation decreases PTH levels, and it also decreases protein media, right? That is what you have to remember. Nephrotoxins and hypothyroidism. First, nephrotoxins, a great number of individuals with CKD may be unaware of their disease because it doesn't have any symptoms. Even if the GFR falls below uh, 60 ml per minute, there are not going to be any symptoms. We said that the symptoms start appearing after the GFR falls below 30 ml, okay? So they will not know. And they may take certain drugs like a carbos uh, or um, this is for diabetes, okay, or chlorpropamide. Glyburide, all these drugs are for diabetes. Nitrofurantoin, you know, it's used for UTIs or NSAIDs, you know, so they will not know that they have chronic kidney disease. They might use them. This will um, aggravate the renal failure or chronic kidney disease. So our, despite availability of guidelines, non-compliance with dosing guidelines, uh, and use of relatively contraindicated medications are common because, you know, everyone is not uh, a health worker. They don't have training in pharmacy or medicine or nursing or respiratory therapy. They don't know uh, most of these people who, are, who have chronic kidney disease, right? Now, hypothyroidism, again, uh, it is detrimental for chronic kidney disease in patients with stages 2 to 4 CKD. Subclinical. Subclinical means there are no signs and symptoms, okay? Um, thyroid 
hormone replacement therapy with L-thyroxine delays the rate of decline. So if a patient comes to you and you find out that he has got chronic kidney disease, it's not a bad idea to do his T3 and T4 and TSH levels as well because they will slow down the progression of the chronic kidney disease. Smoking cessation, we have already mentioned two times that it is important, okay? Now, pathologic manifestations, anemia, you have to control. We have got more on that, but um, when the hemoglobin falls below 10 gram, now let me remind you the normal as well. Normal in males is uh, 13 to 17, again, depends upon the lab, certainly about 12.5 to 16. And in females, it is half a gram less, 12 to 16 gram per deciliter, right? But when it falls below 11, uh, sorry, not 11, below 10, only then we give erythropoiesis stimulating agent, which is apoetin alpha or darbopoietin, okay? But, uh, you know, this is one of the cautions uh, that we have to keep in mind in malignancies. We have to be careful because these drugs um, stimulate cell division in the bone marrow. Hyperphosphatemia, you treat it with dietary phosphate binders, right? Uh, this lanthanum carbonate and uh, the other one, uh, uh, dietary phosphate restriction. These are the two things. We can either have uh, lanthanum or other phosphate binders that have calcium as well in them, or we can restrict dietary phosphate, okay? Uh, you can treat it with calcium supplements with or without calcitriol, okay, vitamin D analog. Hyperthyroidism, treat with uh, hyper, sorry, hyper parathyroidism. Treat with calcitriol, vitamin D analogs, or calcimimetics. All these drugs, they decrease the levels of parathyroid hormone. If there is volume overload, you know, that develops at the last stages of chronic kidney disease, then you can give loop diuretics. Loop diuretics, by the way, are effective below 30 ml GFR. Okay, 30 ml permanent GFR. Uh, the thiazide diuretics are not effective over there. Right, metabolic acidosis, you can treat that with alkali, sodium bicarbonate. Uremic ma manifestations treat with long-term hemodialysis or peritoneal, peritoneal dialysis or renal transplantation. Cardiovascular complications, obviously you need the help of a cardiologist and depending upon the treatment or the type of disease, you have to treat it accordingly. And if there is growth failure in children, as I said, in children, it is mostly because of some um, genetic abnormalities. Then if there is growth retardation, you can treat with growth hormone. Now, erythroid, Anemia, erythropoietin treatment goal is 10 to 12 gram. We start when it is below 10 gram and we do not allow it to go above 12 gram. As normalization of hemoglobin in patients with CKD stages 4 and 5 has been associated with an increased risk of adverse outcome, right? So our goal is to keep it above 10 and either equal to or below 12. All right, so uh, before starting erythropoietin, now when you are giving erythropoietin, you should have enough iron stores in the body. So they must be checked. Okay, and what do you check? You check uh, iron saturation, which is at least, which should at least be 30 to 50% and ferritin, which should be at 20, 200 to 500 nanogram, right? So if, there is deficiency of iron, then you have to give iron supplements. And I showed you in the drug list, we have got so many of them. Okay, so before um, starting erythropoietin, you must normalize the iron stores in the body. Now, uh, diabetes, uh, you have to control hemoglobin A1c. Uh, you have to keep the hemoglobin A1c level below 7%. 7 that is what is recommended. So in people with diabetes, mellitus, and CKD, it is more important than previously realized that a hemoglobin A1C level should be 
kept at the normal, uh, but very intensive therapy or very intensive glycemic control may lead to increased mortality. And the same is true for increased blood pressure or hypertension. Okay? Now, this study showed that in people with non-hemodialysis dependent CKD, a hemoglobin level of higher than 9% is associated with worse clinical outcomes. So the recommendation there was 7%, but at the same time, keep in mind, <clears throat> if you have to give a very aggressive therapy to bring it below 7%, then the aggressive therapy could have its own independent deleterious effects. Low levels of hemoglobin A1C also seem to be associated with uh, excess mortality. Now, mineral and bone disorders, a couple of slides on there. Uh, we have to lower serum phosphate. Uh, you know, what happens is we have seen previously that there is hyperphosphatemia because the GFR is reduced, so phosphorus is not eliminated by the kidneys, so we get hyperphosphatemia. And because the body maintains <clears throat> a product of phosphorus and calcium, the calcium will go down. Whenever phosphorus goes up, Calcium goes down. So usually we develop hypocalcemia as well. And also there is, you know, decreased absor absorption of calcium from the gut in hyperphosphatemia. And uh, then, uh, so we have to lower phosphorus. We have to maintain calcium levels. We have to lower parathyroid hormone levels. And we have to uh, provide prophylaxis of osteoporosis, which is caused by the parathyroid hormone and also by acidemia, okay? Uh, so um, these are a few uh, points in brief. Now, uh, let us see what we have over here. Management of hyperphosphatemia, we have to give phosphate binders, okay? Okay, DIGO guidelines suggest lowering elevated uh, phosphate levels towards the normal range in stages three to five, okay? But NICE guidelines, these are UK guidelines. United Kingdom guidelines, they say that uh, uh, we should maintain higher or we should lower higher elevated phosphate only in stages four and five, okay? They've got another subgroup in 5D. Uh, but the thing is that uh, you have to monitor phosphate levels and if they are high, you have to bring them to normal. So you have got a phosphate binders, which are calcium acetate, which is recommended by NICE guidelines. Calcium acetate is their favorite, but we have got non-calcium phosphate binders, which are several ml carbonate and lanthan lanthanum carbonate, okay? Uh, for adult patients, NICE guidelines recommend calcium acetate as the first line phosphate binder. Some investigators suggest that phosphate binders encourage vascular calcification, uh, I don't know whether it is correct or not, but this is what some researchers will say. I don't know whether they have proved it or not. Hyperthyroidism, there is no evidence of improved mortality in dialysis patients. So we are looking at a specific group, dialysis patients, who were treated with phosphate binders or activated vitamin D, like calcitriol or sinacalcite, right? So uh, if you can, if you try to manage hyperthyroidism in dialysis patients, right, then maybe the benefit is not very big. But you have to treat it. Management of metabolic acidosis, acidosis um, correction of metabolic acidosis may have beneficial effect on protein. No, previously, we have seen, you know, what does it do? It will dissolve the bone. If it will extract calcium and phosphate from the bone, which is known as demineralization of the bone. So um, acidosis or acidemia will cause demineralization, demineralization of the bones, okay? That would lead to osteoporosis. The other thing that causes demineralization is parathyroid hormone. So for acidosis, we have to give alkali therapy, to maintain bicarbonate above 22 milli equivalents per liter. So bicarbonate supplementation in the form of sodium bicarbonate is a good idea. 
cardiovascular risk factors, um, adults aged 50 years or above with an estimated GFR below 60, who are not long, on long-term dialysis or kidney transplantation, they should use statin or statin plus acetamin. Right, so most of, in most of these cases, you will see that we try to use statin and we, use, we try to control uh, this hypercholesterolemia. Statins or statin azetamib should not be initiated in adults with, with dialysis. So keep in mind, we are talking of dialysis dependent or dialysis independent, not on dialysis, okay? Uh, so here, they should not be initiated. Patients already being treated before they started dialysis, they should continue even after dialysis. Adult kidney transplantations should be treated with statin because of an increased risk of coronary artery disease. So you see, we give statins, give statin, give statin, but if you are not giving statin and the patient goes on dialysis, then you don't give statin. Adults aged 18 to 49 years, GFR below 60, who are not on dialysis, not on dialysis like this one, they should be treated with statins. Which patients, you know, they're pretty young, but uh, they can get coronary artery disease or diabetes or prior ischemic stroke and an estimated 10-year risk of coronary death exceeding 10% or non-fatal MI. Okay, so 10-year uh, risk for cardiovascular disease. You know, these are all cardiovascular diseases. For all of these cases, you will start statins. So uh, GFR above 60 ml or higher should be treated with statins. So what you're seeing over here is that in most of these situations, situations except for patients who have already started dialysis, we will not give them statins. All the other situations, we are recommending statins, okay? Uh, and adults with newly, newly diagnosed CKD should do a lipid profile as well. Uh, so CKD, now anticoagulants uh, for atrial fibrillation, you know, cardiovascular problems, atrial fibrillation can lead to formation of a thrombus in the atrium or venous thromboembolism or, uh, or prevention of dialysis excess uh, thrombosis, okay? Uh, so these patients have to be given, to be given uh, anticoagulation. And we, we what the recommendation is to give them non-vitamin K anticoagulants, like uh, the bigger trend and rivaroxaban, apixaban, edoxaban. They are superior to warfarin. Warfarin has been used for a very long time, but these, rel these are relatively new drugs, okay? But uh, they are preferred in this situation because uh, they provide better prevention of stroke and systemic embolism in CQ CKD patients with atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is a big risk factor for formation of thrombus in the atrium, right? And that could lead to stroke or uh, you know, if the thrombus breaks down and becomes an embolus, it can, it can go anywhere in the body. Uh, so not low certainty evidence, not very good evidence, uh, suggests a lower risk of major bleeding with uh, no X. Now these, you know, these uh, newer oral anticoagulants or non-vitamin D oral anticoagulants um, they do have risk for bleeding, you know. They can cause intracerebral hemorrhages or uh, they can cause hematuria. Or they can cause hemorrhages and we should have, uh, we should choose the one for which we have a reversal agent. For example, if you have to take a patient who, are, who is on anticoagulants for an emergency surgery, he will bleed more, right? So we must have a reversal agent for that anticoagulant. Right, renal replacement therapy uh, indications. Now we are talking of dialysis or uh, we are talking of renal transplant. So indications are severe metabolic acidosis, 
hyperkalemia, pericarditis, encephalopathy, uh, intractable volume overload, malnutrition, neuropathy, peripheral neuropathy, GI symptoms, or a GFR below 5 or 9 ml, which is very low. Previously, we said 6, which is an average. So the thing is that dialysis, you will start uh, in many different situations, which are given over here, or when the GFR is below uh, 6, 7, 8, or something like that. Right. Now, planning for renal replacement therapy, you know, you the, the patient has come to your attend, attention, you have tried to slow down the disease and you have to, uh, and you have also tried to control many complications of chronic kidney disease. Uh, but, you know, because eventually the patient will go over to dialysis, so you have to be ready for that. Mm, so, Early patient education regarding disease progression, different types of dialysis. You know, we have so many different types of uh, continuous and uh, three times a week or uh, ultra filtration or peritoneal dialysis. So they should, patients should be educated about all these uh, things, renal transplant, but in renal transplant, it is difficult to get a donor, okay? Uh, timely placement of vascular access in arteriovenous fistula, six months in advance. Okay, that's a pretty long time. Uh, timely elective peritoneal dialysis and catheter in insertion. Again, I don't have uh, the figures over here, but I showed you these figures when we did pathophysiology. Okay, or you can refer for renal transplantation. They will give you a date, which will be a very long date because we do not have enough donors for kidney transplantations. All right, diet. We talked about protein restriction. Uh, you do not have to be very strict on that. We know that fruits and vegetables are always good. So protein restriction early in CKD as a means of delay to decline. GFR is controversial. However, in CKD stage five, this strategy is recommended to delay the onset of urinia. Okay, so this is another situation, which is uh, stage five chronic kidney disease. Or if you have already started uh, uh, protein restriction, you know, then uh, maybe you can continue, but it shouldn't be very strict because of the risk of malnutrition. Uh, CKD patients are at a high risk of malnutrition. Malnutrition is a well-established predictor of increased morbidity and mortality. So although, you know, giving proteins, uh, not giving proteins may be good, some people might say, but, but on the other hand, they can cause increased mortality. Salt restriction uh, is... Uh, recommended by most of the people. Reduction in salt intake may slow the progression of chronic kidney disease by lowering the blood pressure. So moderate dietary sodium, 2,500 milligram, which is 2.5 gram, okay? Or if it is sodium chloride, six gram, added to ACE inhibitors is more effective in reducing protein urea and blood pressure in non-diabetic. All right? So, uh, remember that uh, the cutoff point or the, the recommendation of for day, daily recommendation for daily intake is 2.5 uh, gram or 2,500 milligram per day. Okay. Right. Uh, children with and adults with tubular interstitial disease may experience salt wasting and salt restriction would not be required, okay? So this is one condition. Okay. Other dietary restrictions, phosphate restriction, start or should start early, potassium restriction. Uh, there are certain observational studies that indicate that in individuals with estimated GFR of 30 to 59, which is stage three chronic kidney disease, Plant-based plant -based diets, for example, DASH, whatever it is, you can check on internet. Uh, this may delay progression 
of uh, early stage uh, early stage renal disease and dialysis. Okay, so this will slow down. Then alkali inducing fruits and veg veggies maybe may help reduce uh, chronic kidney disease. Then you have to do routine assessments of serum albumin, uh, body weight, okay, post dialysis, pre dialysis. Uh, standard body weight should be month checked every four months, you know, a referral to a dietitian and uh, protein equivalent of total nitrogen appearance, uh, which means that uh, protein has to be normalized to body weight. Okay. So uh, this is, uh, but in diet, you know, I will, I'm sure you all know that vegetables and fruits are good for everything, all right? So that's, activity is also important, right? 30 minutes, brisk walk five times a day for old people like me, okay, above 60. Kedigo guidelines uh, recommends that patients with chronic kidney disease should take regular exercise, uh, ideally for 30 minutes, five times a week, okay? And Studies have found that patients with CKD participate in physical activity only nine days per month. You want them to do, you know, how much is uh, five days per month? It's more than 20 or 20, 20 or 24 uh, patients is nine days. So it should be, uh, you know, five days per week, which is 20 to 24 days in a month. But Studies have shown that these CKD patients, uh, they do these exercise, which is 30 minute brisk walk for only nine days in a month. And 45% don't do any exercise at all. Now types of physical exercise for patients on dialysis, aerobics, you can watch aerobics, different packages are available on uh, YouTube. Resistance training has shown to benefit. Resistance training is like uh, weight bearing tra training, okay? You take weights or whatever are suitable for you and you do weight lifting sort of exercises. Now, a reason, reasonable approach would be to refer CKD patient to an uh, exercise professional. The trainers that are there, and uh, he should be qualified to prescribe and supervise an exercise program tailored to the patient's need. Okay, so no confusion over there. And I think that's it. We have completed this lecture. And uh, this is the drug list once again that I showed you initially. Uh, we have not covered these drugs individually, but uh, I will, I have got another 50 or 60 slides covering information about these drugs. Uh, clinically, you know, we need to know the warnings and the adverse effects. And among the adverse effects, you know, the adverse effects that are more common. We don't worry about the adverse effects that are less than 1%. So one to 10% are common and more than 10% adverse effects are very common. So those are the ones that we are worried about that we should know or at least we should have a reference for that uh, and their uh, therapeutic uses under specific situations, all right? So maybe if I find time, I'll post uh, that small uh, lecture for you. If there are any questions, you can ask me now. Otherwise, we are done with today's lecture. And we didn't take attendance, just give me one minute. I always forget and nobody reminds me. Okay, boys, please write your names. Right, that is two, three good boys. They are there. Now let us see how many girls are there. That's good, Noura, Sharu, Noor, Muhammad is not a girl. And uh, 
So that's it. And I'll see you next time if there are no questions. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you so much.